very nice to be here with you all. <clears throat> it's very early in the morning uh, where I am, so I, <laughs> I apologize if I'm thinking and speaking more slowly than normal, but I'm happy to be here with you. And, and um, it's been interesting listening to my fellow speakers today, lots of very good information. Um, as we move on to new phases of, of the pandemic, it's, it's obviously important to look at what has worked and what hasn't worked so far um, so that we can rebuild better and, um, and take the learnings and, and, and these programs that are still very active, um, we can, we can use them and, uh, and hopefully make them stronger as, as we go. Um, I know many of you are facing challenges in your home countries with government response to the, to the pandemic. Um, it's continuing to evolve, to evolve like we just heard. It's the same here in, in the U.S. Um, it's been, Difficult because there's uh, a lack of political will um, to uh, to continue with the mitigation measures um, uh, for COVID-19 uh, that we know work, but there isn't really the will um, to to uh, implement them anymore. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, we have burnout uh, and just general exhaustion from those of us in public health and and medicine who have been doing this work now since the beginning of the of the pandemic. And so it's it's sometimes difficult to to work on uh, to, on this continued work while doing all of the other work uh, that that we all do in, in public health. So all of you know what that is like, and uh, that's part of why I'm happy to be here with you all today because I am uh, speaking with colleagues who know what I'm talking about and uh, and have their own jobs and their own perspectives. So thank you again um, uh, for for allowing me to be here today. What I'm going to be talking about is um, uh, PGP, uh, so the organization I run, which as you heard is a public health nonprofit. Um, it's active globally, but um, this program I'm speaking about today is a U.S.-based program that was funded by U.S. CDC, um, and then my organization uh, received funding through one of CDC's uh, grantees. Uh, to manage part of the part of the program, so I will be walking you through uh, the successes and failures and challenges, uh, and hopefully you get something out of this presentation that you can apply to your own work. Um, the next couple slides I'm going to be sharing are from another presentation. They're from uh, my colleague at at CDC. Uh, her name is Benita Harris McBride, and she's the racial and ethnic minority populations liaison and subject matter expert from CDC. So uh, Benita handled um, CDC's uh, the, the entirety of CDC's program, um, and uh, and again, uh, my organization handled a smaller piece uh, of it. We can move on to the next slide. Um, so the program itself is called Partnering for Vaccine Equity. Uh, those of us who worked on the program shortened the name. We made it an acronym because we all work in public health and we love acronyms. So you can see P4VE, we ended up calling the program PAVE for short because it had such a long name. So if you see PAVE, that's all that that means. It stands for Partnering for Vaccine Equity. And what what this program is, what the PAVE program is, was $156 million um, came from the U.S. government to the U.S. CDC, and then the U.S. CDC distributed that funding to dozens of organizations at multiple levels in the country to try and close the gap, um, the immunization gap, and, and specifically adult immunization gap um, between uh, racial and ethnic minorities in the United States as compared to white or Caucasian populations in the United States. So it was really meant to focus specifically on areas of uh, low vaccination rates and, um, and even more specifically, of course, on the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, so lots of partners and very much focused on um, equity, um, uh, on health equity, um, through through all of that all of that lens. Um, so again, focus on racial and ethnic communities in the United States. I think we can go to the next slide. 
and this is uh, this is a complicated visual, but all this slide is trying to show is CDC was given this money because all of our data in the United States uh, was showing that immunization rates in communities of color and racial and ethnic minority communities were uh, too low. They were much lower than um, than uh, white communities um, and other communities such as uh, Asian communities in the United States. This has been a longstanding problem uh, before the pandemic, but the pandemic really exacerbated uh, the issue. It became an urgent emergency situation because we needed to get vaccines in arms, and we had to uh, work very quickly to address uh, challenges that had been around for a very long time, uh, challenges that were uh, caused by structural racism in the United States systems that uh, have uh, are legacy systems that have been around for a very long time and that have created the disparity in immunization rates, um, the, the difference between uh, white communities and other communities in the, in the U.S. Um, so we focused on a, a whole of society approach, starting from the vaccinated individual and then all of the different factors and, and layers uh, in their community. Um, in their state that they live in, and then on the national side. And so CDC went and looked at all of the different organizations that reached all of these different racial and ethnic uh, populations within the country and distributed money um, to uh, the best organizations they could, they could find. And then each one of those organizations had its own scope of work um, that came out of that $156 uh, million. I think we can go to the next slide. So this is a visual of just all of the organizations that were part of this effort. Some uh, worked specifically on health communications. Some worked on systems change. Some were more focused on the healthcare sector. Some were more focused on public health. And again, some were focused at the national level, some at the state, and some at the local. So you can do a lot with $156 million, and a lot was done. Over 500 partner organizations were all working in concert um, across 64 states and territories and local immunization programs. So a, a, a quite a massive effort. And again, we were starting uh, behind because we already, <clears throat> we already had a problem in the United States about this disparity in immunization rates. Um, you can see that disparity across flu vaccination, across routine childhood uh, immunization, and across adult uh, immunization. The part that my organization managed is where that red square is, that red rectangle. So we received money from CDC Foundation, which is a separate foundation that works very closely with CDC, um, and CDC Foundation w uh, distributed its funding to uh, over 100 community-based organizations uh, across the United States. PGP, uh, the nonprofit that I run, is uh, focused on health communications predominantly, um, has a very large program uh, tracking and responding to health misinformation and vaccine misinformation specifically. And so we devised a way to respond to vaccine misinformation in real time very quickly as we were uh, identifying it in the media and social media and, and the media, and then getting that information to community-based organizations across the country. And those community-based organizations were selected based on the racial and ethnic minority populations that they serve, that they, uh, they already are trusted by they already reach. So lots of layers uh, to this, um, but you can see uh, a lot of coordination was necessary. And, uh, and we think we did a, we, we think we did a good job. We did, we did a, in an, in an emergency situation. Um, I, I think we all pulled together and a lot of meetings, a lot of zoom calls, <laughs> a lot of emails. Um, but we did the best that we could. And I think we saw a good result. If you can go to the next slide. Um, the idea around CDC foundations, uh, the, the part of this work uh, 
that my organization was involved in is here on this slide. So we worked to identify uh, information that was related to vaccine hesitancy that was circulating through traditional and digital media. Um, we also worked with the social media uh, companies and the media companies in, based in the United States and provided them technical assistance and helped them shape misinformation policies so that we could mitigate the impact of misinformation on these platforms, on these channels. So we were working with community-based organizations at the community level, and then at the national level, we were meeting with executives from all of the social media companies and television and radio uh, uh, companies as well, trying to educate them while we were uh, working with and, and supporting community organizations. Um, any time we would discover misinformation, we would fact check it and uh, debunk it, and then we would provide talking points um, that debunked that misinformation to both the social media companies um, and to the community organizations. Both would occur at the same time. Um, and any time we provided talking points, we provided uh, also communication materials that were tailored for the local populations and for the different cultural and sociocultural contexts of the uh, racial and ethnic minority populations that the community organizations served. There were lots of partners involved in this, as I said, and many of those partners um, know these communities very well, um, are representatives of these communities themselves. Um, and so they would be the ones that created the culturally relevant, the tailored health communications uh, my organization was responsible for identifying the misinformation, translating the science, and then working with the organizations that understood the culture. Um, so we all worked again together very, very closely. I think if you can go to the next slide. And the reason I think we did a good job, and this is CDC's, US CDC's perspective as well, is we saw that reflected in the in the data. So we think that because we had so many partners all doing the same thing, all working toward the same goal in a highly coordinated fashion. What you, what you see here on this slide is we did close the gap. Um, in the beginning of the pandemic here in the United States, there was a very big gap in immunization rates for COVID-19 vaccines uh, between racial and ethnic minorities as compared to white and Asian populations in, in the U.S., as we continued to collect data, we found that the gap closed significantly um, and the situation improved. And, um, and if you follow uh, the news or the public health data out of the U.S., what you see today is the focus is less on communities of, of color, although there is still a lot of work being done there, and more focused on rural white populations conservative uh, populations uh, that are white in the United States, that's actually where we have the lowest immunization rates now. That did not occur by accident. That occurred because $156 million and, um, and many different organizations were very focused on communities of color and actually improved the situation there. Um, I think we can go to the next slide. So, just a quick overview of um, how it all worked and what we accomplished uh, together in its first year. At the moment, we're uh, actually in the next year, so this program has been funded again, um, not at the same level, and some of these strategies and priorities have shifted because the pandemic has, has shifted, um, uh, as well as public health needing to go back to other priority topics like the opioid epidemic here in the United States and, and the the epidemic of, uh, of mental health also, um, lots to do. Um, we can go to the next slide. We had four objectives for the, for the program. Uh, the first was identifying misinformation um, and then uh, in both Spanish media as well as English language media. Um, there had not been very much work in the U.S. focused on Spanish language misinformation and disinformation. Um, there's not very much research there, and there are almost no programs that track, uh, that identify and track 
uh, misinformation in Spanish language media. So this was the largest and the first effort in the United States to attempt this, and lots of partners were involved. Um, the biggest partner of ours was an organization called HCN, or the Hispanic Communications Network, which is a bunch of radio and television and websites um, that all uh, reach Spanish-speaking audiences uh, in the United States. Um, HCN is a, is, has been around for a long time uh, and a really, really great partner um, for us. So we then took what we found in terms of misinformation, like I said, and we addressed that with social media companies. In particular, we addressed that with Twitter uh, at the time. Um, objective three was to react. So what we found became talking points, health communication materials, that were given out to local partners, um, distributed through a large network of media partners. Um, and then uh, objective four was um, create an influencer network and a network of community-based organizations uh, that could get our talking points in front of the public uh, in the United States, specifically communities of, of color, um, and even more specifically, uh, people who uh, speak Spanish. I think we can go to the next slide. Uh, we surpassed our goals. Uh, so we were trying to reach 28 million people um, in the U.S. Uh, we, this is just an estimate, but we believe we uh, reached over 40 million uh, people in the United States. Um, just through our work alone, this is, this is not all of the $153 million. This is just for the work that my organization and, and our partners w were responsible for. Um, and then we tried to uh, recruit and sustain engagement with influencers, with individuals who have a great influence in their own social networks, online and offline, but particularly online and social media. And we wanted to reach uh, about 1,250 uh, to recruit them um, so that it, we can give them information and uh, they would share it. And what we found was uh, we, we got a greater number, a little over 1,500 uh, influencers were, were, were recruited. So we can go to the next slide. APIs uh, were measured, by the way. Um, many of the systems that we use for um, for our our work uh, in this program and others will provide you they, they provide our teams our analysts with an estimated uh, reach and frequency and, and impressions and, and things like that so um, some of it was a uh, an estimation uh, by the community organizations who reported back to us how many people they were able to reach some of it was our own systems it all came together into that uh, estimate of how many individuals uh, we reached. I think we can go to the next slide. So um, TGP runs the largest system in North America that tracks vaccine misinformation. That system is called Project VCTR or Project Vector. Any of you, if you go to projectvctr.com, can request access to this system. It's updated once a week, but the system runs um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it identifies misinformation across a whole bunch of different media, social media and traditional media, and then teams of journalists and analysts decipher that information and report out to public health professionals and journalists across Canada and the United States. We added in Spanish language capabilities because of this program, because we were given funding to do so. And so now Project VCTR, Project Vector, um, does it in both English and Spanish. So we captured about 35 million uh, references to um, uh, uh, Spanish uh, language references to vaccines and, and misinformation. And you can see about 212 million in, in English. Um, the themes of conversation that uh, could uh, that was readily identifiable as misinformation as inaccurate or not true um, generally fell into four main themes COVID-19 of course and then negative health impacts of vaccines negative perceptions of the pharmaceutical industry 
like they're just in it for profit, and then negative perceptions of health authorities, um, which has become a real problem here in the United States. The pandemic um, for for a large proportion of, of the United States actually worsened people's perception of public health uh, rather than improve it. Um, I think you can go to the next slide. Um, anytime we found misinformation, we produced uh, reports. So we would contextualize the misinformation. We would explain uh, what, what does this mean? Where did we find it? Um, why is this important? Uh, and so we did that over 200 times. And then uh, we reported that information to the social media companies, um, as well as to all of our partners. They received this information in different ways. Twitter needs different information than a community-based organization, but um, the same system uh, power was behind the scenes doing both. They can go to the next slide. Um, well, what we were also doing was on Twitter, Twitter was uh, had verified accounts um, at the time that were difficult to, that blue check mark was not easy to get. Uh, and so part of this program was identifying um, important public health accounts or expert accounts in the United States that were not verified and working with Twitter to verify them. So we were able to verify 49 uh, large public health accounts. Um, some of the examples of accounts that we were able to verify are on, are on the slide. And then we reported, we provided 34 reports to Twitter on vaccine misinformation to help them understand and revise their algorithms. All of this work has been destroyed because of Elon Musk's recent decisions to dismantle the content moderation teams at Twitter. Um, almost none of the staff that we worked with uh, are there anymore. They've all been fired. Um, and the uh, and now anyone can get a verified account. I will also say that many of the accounts that we were able um, to report that were deliberately spreading vaccine misinformation, they um, all of them have been allowed back on the platform. Uh, so it's a huge problem, and uh, from a public health perspective, um, I, I don't. We we have yet to see the impact of uh, these decisions that uh, that Elon Musk has made, but we know that they will cause uh, death and disease. Um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, we worked with Hispanic media, so these are television and radio stations for the most part, and we basically uh, helped them understand health misinformation and why people in public health were so concerned about health misinformation. This is a very new topic to media companies in the United States and everywhere, and so they needed uh, public health, they needed the public health perspective to be translated into a business perspective to help uh, the business executives responsible for television and radio to understand why is this important to my business? What role do we play in society? And can we address misinformation without it hurting our bottom line, without losing money, and without losing audience members? It's not an easy task. And public health is traditionally very bad at working with businesses. So this was a whole other part of, of the work. And uh, this work is ongoing. We've been, we've been successful in finding the right people at these uh, companies, and so the conversations are, are continuing. Um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, <clears throat> the influencer, the idea behind the influencer network was probably most of you have heard of influencers um, and, and are probably intrigued at their potential for public health programs and health communication programs. At one of the things PGP does is build influencer networks. So we find influencers, we recruit them, and we, uh, we add them to a network uh, that, that is sustainable. So this influencer, this person who reaches a lot of people that public health wants to reach, understands that they will be asked again and again to share a talking point, to share information with their audience. They understand that that's their role. Um, and But in the past, CDC did not have an, a network of influencers that were always ready 
to take public health information and, and give it to, the, to their audiences. So part of this effort was recruiting influencers that would remain with the program for at least a year um, and then giving those influencers talking points. Every single time we saw misinformation that was serious, we would uh, inform the influencers and they would inform their audiences. Um, and we would do this according to best practices uh, so we wouldn't make the situation worse by adding fuel to the fire. We were very carefully crafting our, our talking points to debunk and pre-bunk the misinformation that we were um, that we were identifying. Uh, PGP is an expert in misinformation, and the other organizations we were working with were also experts in, in misinformation. So we were able to recruit um, about 1,500 individuals who um, uh, very effectively reach Spanish-speaking populations uh, in the United States. This was done through um, an initiative called El Beacon, uh, which was part of the, low, the larger overall effort. I think we can, we can continue. Um, so these uh, influencers posted over a thousand times, uh, reached uh, about 66 million people. Um, when they would post, uh, they would, uh, about 7 uh, million people saw our talking points, um, and that led to about, about 500,000 engagements. Engagements mean someone actually commented on that post, or they actually liked it or shared it. So it's just a measure of um, going the next step beyond looking at, at the post. Um, so lots and lots of uh, people out there every day working. Um, you can see just some examples of uh, the newsletters, uh, the emails that would go out to the influencers. I won't read all of this. You'll, you have the slides, but a um, uh, pretty coordinated effort from finding the misinfo to creating the talking points to writing the emails and, and the alerts going out to the influencers and then the influencer adding their own voice and their own words to reach their audience. Not easy to do. takes a lot of people, but it can be done. Some examples of influencer posts here. So um, these are some of the top influencers that we worked with um, that reach uh, Hispanic or uh, Latinx uh, audiences. Um, you can see their names and, and their reach and an example of one of the posts that they that they made during uh, this first year of, of the effort. We can go on to the next slide. Um, and then just two more examples here of um, what they said, how they said it, and the engagements. Um, uh, and then we'll, we'll, let's continue on with the slides. Um, because people in public health are still new to influencers, um, what, we, what we like to do is evaluate the impact on the influencer themselves. So we all know that when a health department or a public health organization says anything online about COVID-19 vaccines, they're met with overwhelming negativity. Almost all of the comments are negative. Um, that is not true when an influencer says something about vaccines. Uh, what we have found time and time again is that if an influencer um, says, you should go get your booster or go get vaccinated, here's why I'm doing it, here's why I think you should do it, um, if, um, overwhelmingly, almost every single time, um, they get a lot of comments and almost all of those comments, 97% of those comments are positive. Things like, thank you for this information. I will go get vaccinated. I really appreciate you helping. Very positive comments and almost no negativity. So as negativity toward public health in all countries increases, we think influencers and community organizations play a really, really important role in getting information to the public because as the public is less and less interested in hearing from public health organizations, we need, we can't just stop giving information. We need new, more creative ways to reach hard to reach populations. By the way, I don't like the term hard to reach population because it makes it sound like it's that population's fault to be hard to reach. If, if a population is hard to reach, that just means we're not being creative enough. We're not, we're not good enough at our jobs. 
in today's world, no one is impossible to reach. Um, so really, the, the, it's incumbent upon us to figure out how to reach a population, not for that population to make themselves somehow more available to us. Um, that's my own perspective, uh, but we can go ahead and continue with the slide. Um, just some examples of how many uh, communication materials were sent out, quite, quite a lot. We can go on to the next slide. Some examples of the creative. Uh, we were uh, sending out images um, it, uh, almost every single day. So lots of different styles, lots of different um, messages and approaches, but just some, some simple examples here. Everything was in English and Spanish. Lots of trainings. Um, to the community organizations, uh, uh, a pretty good number of people showed up for the for the trainings. Um, some of the topics of the trainings you can see on the on the slides. A lot of interest in community organizations on how to do this work. Um, uh, for a lot of them, this was brand new. They were not. Um, they may have addressed health before, but they did not know a lot about vaccines. Um, they were brand new to that topic, and so they wanted to learn from public health experts as they were uh, communicating and, uh, and reaching the, their communities. Um, so it, there, there really needed to be a, a good feedback loop uh, between, between the, uh, the two. Um, go ahead and, yes, thank you. And then some virtual events. So we would bring in community leaders and uh, experts and have them talk to each other. Um, and uh, we also engage for consulates uh, for Latin American countries that uh, would reach uh, their audiences and give their perspective. So um, lots of moving parts uh, in this in this program, but we again, we think collectively it, it made a, a positive impact. Um, let's go ahead to the next slide. Um, just some examples of all of the different places our messages ended up. Um, radio, uh, public service announcements, op-eds, uh, would be opinion pieces, um, digital ads, satellite radio, and, and social media. So quite a lot of messages going out in quite a lot of places. Um, and again, HCN was an amazing partner uh, for, for that effort. So just the key takeaways, um, this is, I think we're on my last slide. I can uh, go ahead and move, move forward. Um, for, for, as far as influencers go, um, it's time for public health to catch up. So we're UNICEF's main partner in vaccine misinformation. We run UNICEF's very large vaccine demand observatory, which tracks vaccine misinformation in all countries that UNICEF is in. I have yet to see a country anywhere in the world, whether it's low income, middle income, or high income, that does not have hundreds or thousands of people who meet the definition of an influencer. Um, uh, there, every single country in the world has people on social media, a lot of people on social media. And of those people, a lot of them reach a lot of people, including hard to reach populations. So it's try I think it's time for public health to catch up, learn best practices from other fields like marketing and advertising, uh, PR. There are fields that uh, have been using influencers for quite a long time. There are very, very good evidence-based practices from those other fields, um, uh, and we can use those practices and apply them to our uh, our own needs. Um, so it's it's just time that we catch up and we we figure out how we're going to work with uh, with influencers um, because they're much more effective at reaching populations that typically than, than than public health organizations are, especially on social media. Um, CBO support or community-based organization support is absolutely critical. Um, local public health departments in, in the United States do a very good job of working with community organizations, but public health in the U.S., in, in, the, in the United States, is really controlled at the federal level, at the national level. And at the national level, um, there has not been enough support for community organizations. It's very top-down. Um, and it, uh, and what, what, what came out, one of the things that we learned during the pandemic was that model has to be broken, um, and has to be rebuilt in a, in a better way. Um, because state health departments, federal agencies are just never going to be able to increase vaccination rates 
without working with hundreds and thousands of community organizations who actually know what they're talking about, have much more expertise in their communities than public health uh, departments do, um, and they need a seat at the table. Um, policy, so during the, this program, Twitter was very engaged. Twitter, uh, uh, I never talked to anybody at, at Twitter who didn't understand the importance of health misinformation. Uh, they would always pick up the phone, they would always answer their, their email, and they were actively engaged, they were really helping. All of that has stopped um, because of the recent news, and so um, I think we're still going to see what the impact of that is, but it's going to be bad. It's going to be really bad. Um, so uh, there are many other media companies, um, and we're still working with all of the other media companies, um, and, and again, the challenge there is translating public health priorities to business priorities. They don't care about public health. <laughs> they do as people, they want to help, but we need to meet them halfway. We can't just finger wag and say they need to be doing a better job. Um, and then uh, looking forward, year two has been funded. Um, and th and what the, the new strategy that we'll be employing is local journalism. So community organizations being supported by journalists writing news stories for the audiences of the community-based organizations. So a lot going on, really exciting work. Um, like I said, lots of organizations involved, very much a collective impact model behind this program. Um, but uh, I, uh, we all believe we're, we're doing um, uh, important work and that the numbers uh, show the impact. Um, so I think that is my, my last slide and then I can, uh, yeah, just thank you very much for your time. Uh, you can see Darshana P uh, Panchal is uh, the person responsible for PGP's part of the work. She's our program manager. So if you have any questions about anything that you've seen today, please feel free to email her, and we'll do our best to, um, to send you an answer quickly.